Welcome everyone to the class on Christology. Thank you for um, joining class. And um, we'll begin looking, uh, uh, studying chapter three. Okay. Uh, we basically, in chapters one and two, we studied about the uh, chapters one and two, what did, what aspect of Jesus we studied? The deity of Jesus, okay? And um, we established the fact that Jesus is God. Um, and we looked at various scripture passages, okay, which point out to his. The first lesson we studied was his pre-existence. And the second lesson we studied about his equality with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Okay. And lesson three, we started uh, studying about his role in creation. Why are we studying Jesus' role in creation? Okay, by uh, showing his role in creation, we're trying to prove that he was there at the time of creation. Okay. Um, so in this chapter, uh, and again, we're trying to prove his deity, that he is God. Okay. Uh, so we looked at the familiar passages of scripture, and we look at, um, and uh, basically we were studying Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, basically looking from verses 15 to 18. Okay. So we continue our study. Uh, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Online students? Online students, can you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Let, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just wish to thank you for this hour of study. Father, we pray that whatever we're going to learn today, Father, we, we will be able to remember it and apply it in our lives father we pray that uh, you you bless our teachers and bless all the students and may, may we continue to grow lord in the, in thy word and in, and in the spirit father we ask all of this lord jesus in thy precious name amen amen thank you so much okay so colossians chapter one which we were studying um we looked and what is colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 18 called as the great christology yes because here you know um oh, we have a deeper understanding about who jesus christ is okay it qualifies jesus christ to be the preeminent one who has the supremacy over all things okay uh, we looked at, we studied two phrases. The first one is Jesus Christ is in the image of the invisible God. Okay. And we also studied that he's the firstborn over all creation. So we try to understand what is the meaning of the word firstborn. Firstborn means first in priority or first in precedence in creation. In all time, he is you know, before creation, his precedence to all creation in time and his sovereignty over all creation, which means in rank, he's sovereign, he's head, he's over all. Okay. And we stop there. So we look at verse 16. Can somebody read verse 16, please? For it was in him that all things were created in heaven and on earth, things seen and things unseen, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things were created and exist through him and in and for him. Okay, he himself is before all things and all things were held together in him. Okay, now look at how this verse starts, verse 16. It starts with the word for, right? So the apostle is beginning his explanation and proof of why Jesus Christ is sovereign over all creation. 
Okay, so he's pointing to the reason uh, to the reader that the reason uh, Christ is the image of God is because he is the creator. Okay, and also we look at that you know in all things, whether it's in the natural or in the spiritual realm, everything was created by Christ through him and for him, and in him all things consist. Okay, which means he's in verse 17 says he's before all things and him, in him all things hold together. So let's look at these phrases. Um, you know, for in him all things were created. Okay, that means we look at these phrases created by him, created through him, created for him, and in him all things consist. What does these phrases mean? So what do these phrases created by him, created through him, created for him, and in him all things consist mean? Okay. So here this word him, who is it referring to? Yes, Jesus. And Jesus is the author of creation. That means he created everything. Okay. So which means if he created everything, he is not a created being himself. He's certainly not a created being and certainly is not even the first created being as many people say that you know Jesus is the first created being because they use this verse firstborn of all creation he's not a created being okay he was the one who created everything he was there even before the foundations of the world and he's he's a reason why everything was created Okay, so he himself is the creator of all things, all things that we see here on earth and all things in heaven, everything that is material, that means everything that we can touch, feel, see, okay, taste, and everything in the spiritual, which is the invisible. Okay, so he is one who created everything in the invisible and the visible. So why is Paul stressing so much on Jesus? being the creator, that everything was created by him, everything was created through him, everything is created for him, and in him all things consist. Why is Paul stressing on this, on the creation aspect of Jesus Christ, that he created everything? Why do you think he's stressing on There was it? nothing before him that was made. Okay, there was nothing before him that was made. So everything exists because of him. That means he was before all things were made, okay? What else? Why is he stressing that God alone, Jesus alone created everything? By proving that Jesus alone created everything, he's trying to tell us that, hey, only God can create, right? God is the only one who can make things. God is the only one who can create things. So when he's saying that Jesus is the one who created everything in the visible and invisible in the material, in the spiritual realm, he's trying to say, hey, Jesus is God. He's not man. Okay. He is God. He's God who became incarnate. God who became man. Okay. And um, we read this also in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So this is well established fact or truth in the mind of a Jew. Okay. So trying to prove that Jesus is God, he's saying, hey, he's the one who created, Jesus is the one who created everything through him, everything was created for him, everything was created, which means he's going pointing them back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and Earth. So by proving that Jesus created everything, he's saying, hey, Jesus is deity. He is God. So here he's talking about the supremacy of the Son of God that is Jesus. Okay. And Paul is stating this fact that Jesus is the creator. And by proving this fact, he's trying to prove again that he is God. He is deity. Okay. So you know, uh, what, uh, the second phrase we look at is he cre everything was created through him. Everything was created through him means what? 
everything was created through Jesus. Yes, the hymn is Jesus. So Jesus is the mediator of the entire process of creation. So we can see it this way. God the Father was the one who, the author or the one who planned creation. Okay. And Jesus is the one who spoke it. Okay. He's the word. He spoke it. And the Holy Spirit is the one who brought things to pass. Okay. I'll repeat that again. God the Father was the one who planned creation. Jesus is the one who spoke it. And the Holy Spirit was the one who brought things to pass. Okay. Look at what Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 uh, states. States this fact that, you know, Jesus is the one who spoke and he brought things into existence. How can we prove this? Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. Can somebody read that please? In many separate revelations, each of which set forth a portion of the truth, and in different ways God spoke of old to our forefathers in and by the prophets. But in the last of these days, he has spoken to us in the Son, in the person of a Son, whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things, also by and through whom he created the worlds and the reaches of the space and the ages of time. He is the sole expression of the glory of God, and he is the perfect imprint and very image of nature upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. When he had, by offering himself, accomplished our cleansing of sins and riddance of guilt, he sat down at the right hand of the divine majesty on high. Amen. Thank you. So look at what it says in uh, verse 2, the last phrase in verse 2. It says, through him also he made the worlds. Okay, so through whom? Who is this whom? Through Jesus, also he made the worlds. He is here referring to God the Father. Okay, so through whom? Through whom is Jesus? He also made the worlds. And look at what what verse three says: upholding, or and Jesus is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power okay so jesus is the one who's sustaining all of creation holding everything in its place and how is he doing it how is he sustaining and upholding everything in this universe by the power of his word by the power of his word thank you yes he's upholding everything to the power of his world so everything was created through him the third phrase everything is created for him so the reason why all of creation was created is for whom? Yes, so that they can serve him and glorify God. So all of creation was created for him so that all of creation can serve and glorify God. Okay, look at verse 16. Verse 16 of uh, Colossians chapter 1. Okay, verse 16 says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Okay? And it says here he is before all things, right? Verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Okay, so he is before all things and also he is the one who created everything. Okay, in him all things were created. Okay, so this, this phrase, um, he is before, you know, the pronoun here is he, right? It, it stresses on Christ's unique position and his preeminence before all things. What is the meaning of preeminence? His authority, his supremacy, his dominions over everything. So Paul is stressing, he's saying he's before, he's using the pronoun he here, he's saying he is before, it means he's laying the stress 
on Christ's unique position and his preeminence or his superiority or his prominence before all things, which means that Christ alone, it is he himself and no one else. It is Christ himself and no one else who created all these things. He, Christ himself was before all things. Now the phrase, he is, okay, very um, nice uh, to look at it in Greek, when you look at it in Greek, it is auto, autos istin. The Greek word for he is in Greek is autos istin. The, the word autos means he or himself. And the word istin in Greek is the third person for a singular form of the verb to be or to exist. Okay, so if you look at it, it is actually he himself is to be or to exist. Okay, but it is translated as is, he is. But if you look at it in Greek, it gives us a much more deeper meaning. It means to be or to exist. So he himself is to be, he himself exists by himself. But here it's translated as is. Okay, so if you Put this together, it signifies that he is or he exists, which emphasizes his active, Christ's active and eternal presence in the act of bringing all things into existence. Okay, so that is why I brought out this Greek word. It's not there, I think, in your notes, but I'm trying to explain it through the Greek because Greek gives us a much richer meaning he he is it just basically doesn't mean he is before all creation okay he was before all creation but actually it means that you know he exists before creation the word is thin in greek for which is translated as is also means to be or to exist that means he existed even before uh, creation and another interesting um, uh, thing that when you look at it in Greek, this word autos uh, uh, estin, uh, the emphasis on the verb autos, which is he, and which is combined with this word estin, which is is or to be or to exist, also we get the word imi, which means I am, I exist. So here Jesus was basically, Paul is using this Greek word, he is, is basically he's saying that, you know, he is before all creation means, is basically saying, I am before all creation. So he's using the, the word that was the title for God, which we looked at in John chapter 8, verse 58. We also see it in the Old Testament where God reveals himself as I am. So here, this word, this phrase, he is, is expressed as autos estin, but emphasizes here, is the emphasis here is on the intense use of autos, that is he, combined with the present tense. If you combine it with the present tense, emi, which means I am, I exist. So he, what Paul is trying to say is, hey, he was not born and then created everything, but he is the I am. He existed even before creation was. Okay, and thus connecting Jesus to the the title of God, who is the I am. Are you able to understand? Yes. No. No. Kind of. Okay. You don't have to worry. I'm just saying that the word he is is just not okay. He is before creation, but the word is basically means he exists or to be, which means he is the I am. He existed or he was even before the world was created. And through him, everything is created. So the verse, um, uh, the phrase, before all things, okay? Um, so Paul is mentioning one of the reasons Christ is over all creations is because he was before all things. Okay, so showing again his preeminence, his prominence, his authority. Okay, so what does Paul mean when he says that Christ is before all things? Now, before all things, basically is talking about Christ's eternal nature, that Christ is eternal. Okay, again, he's mentioning here, Paul is trying to mention that Christ is not a created being, 
he existed before anything was even created which means he was he eternally existed as part of the godhead and how do we know this john chapter 1 verse 1 and also we saw this uh, prophesied through the prophet micah remember we read micah chapter 5 verse 2 you know, but thou, uh, Bethlehem Ephrathah, even though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you will come forth a ruler of all Israel, whose going forth has been from of old, from everlasting. Remember, we studied this phrase. So, you know, Micah predicted that the one to come was going to be from everlasting. Okay. So, Christ is before all things, so Paul is trying to connect all of these dots, okay, connecting it to what Micah prophesied, you know, John chapter 1, verse 1, he's saying Christ is before all things, and therefore he is the, he is God, therefore he created everything, and therefore he's worthy of all exaltation and all glory, okay? So what makes Christ transcendent, which means what makes him, uh, you know, to uh, there is nothing like him is because the heavens had a beginning, the earth had a beginning, humanity had a beginning, but not Christ. Christ was without any beginning because he is from everlasting. He is over all creation because he was before creation and therefore he is God and therefore he is eternal and therefore he is everlasting. Okay. So if you look at this um, uh, verses in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 to 20, you can look at the frequent occurrence of the phrase or the words, all things, and by him. By him all things were created in the past. By him all things consist in the present. By him all things are to be reconciled in the future. So if you look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 20, there's so many times he's mentioned all things and by him. Okay, so Paul is trying to say that in Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells, which means he is God. Okay, Romans chapter 11 verse 36. Can somebody read that please? Romans 11 36. Romans 11 36. Online students, all of you with me, very quiet today. Shall I go ahead, sister? Yes, please, Lucy. Thank you. Romans 11, 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. So here, you know, Paul is again saying, of him and through him and to him are all things. And because he's created everything, he is God. And because of that, all glory and honor and praise to him are loan because he is the alpha and the omega he's the beginning and the end and he's the all in all okay so that is the meaning of the phrase before all things and all things were created for him the next phrase is in him all things consist okay now paul summarizes the son's relationship or jesus's relationship with creation with the words he is the creator. He's not only the creator, but he's also the power that holds all of creation together, which means he is the one who sustains all of creation. Okay. He is a sustainer of all of creation. So the, the word consists in him, all things consist. What does this word consist mean? Now, the Greek word for consist is sunisteno. Okay, and sunisteno is from which we get the English word sustain. Okay, so all things were created by Christ. It's not only created by him, but he is sustaining all things. That means everything is conserved. Everything is held together by whom? By the power of Christ's word. Okay. Look at what Acts chapter 17, verse 28 says. And uh, somebody else can read 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, and um, Hebrews 1, verse 3. So can somebody please read Acts 17, 28? Uh, can I read, sister? Yes, please, sister. Go ahead. For in him we live and move and have our being, 
as also some of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring amen so here paul is saying that for in him we live and move and have our being which means what what does this phrase mean for in him we live and move and have our being means what what does it mean for in him are, yeah go ahead lucy we are his children okay we exist because of him yes we exist because of him uh, sanjay says he's a source of all life he's a source of our being he's a source of our nourishment he's a source of our strength he's a source of our hope he's a very reason that we are living and having our being because we have the breath of god in us okay first corinthians 8 verse 6 can somebody read that please First Corinthians eight six. First Corinthians eight six. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. Amen. Thank you. So here it says uh, we have one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all. Things. That means who brought about everything that we see, even our own existence is through him and through him whom we live. We have our life in him. He's the one who sustains us. Okay. And also we read in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 that the entire universe is held or sustained by the power of his word. Can somebody read Hebrews 1 3 please? Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high amen so he's who is upholding all things jesus and how is he upholding everything by the power of his word Okay, so here we saw through various scripture passages and basically focusing on Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 18, more uh, looking at 16 and 17 in depth, and how Jesus Christ is the one who created everything and he sustains everything and thus he is deity. So what should be our response to God who is our creator? Or what should be our response to Jesus who is the creator? What should be our response? The first response is we need to consider, right? Think about, ponder, think about everything that we have been learning about God or who God is. As the psalmist says in Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Can somebody read that, please? Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. All of you are sleepy. <laughs> wakey, wakey. Okay, Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Please read. When I view and consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained and established, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? So what is the psalmist saying in verse 3? When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers the moon and the stars so he's looking at creation he's considering he's pondering he's thinking so we need to take time to consider god's nature his attributes his works okay consider his works that he is the omnipotent creator that we see in all creation the powerful uh, you know uh, he he created everything with the power of his word and how beautiful creation is so we need to consider we need to ponder ponder means what keep on thinking about it meditating on god and his works what happens when we ponder we meditate when we consider all of what god has created what happens we can know his greatness yes what else also lost in his majesty 
We're lost in His majesty, in His glory, in His power, yes. When you consider the work of God, His creation, His omnipotent power we see in creation, the perfectness, the order, the beauty, you know, it just gets us to see His glory, right? Uh, because um, in Romans chapter uh, 1 verses 20, it says, you know, the, in, the, uh, the invisible attributes of God. We can't see God, right? But uh, Paul is saying, hey, you don't have excuse. Those of you who are Gentiles, not Jews, the Jews, they don't have an excuse because they have the law. So he's arguing from that point of view in Romans chapter 1. He's saying, you Jews, you have the law. But you Gentiles can, can't say, hey, we didn't have the law. We didn't know about God. He did not reveal himself to us. But Paul is saying that, you know, for since, for since the creation, that means from ever since God created everything ever since creation of this world he says the invisible attributes of god are clearly seen that means when you ponder when you look at creation when you think about creation what do you see in creation the invisible attributes of god okay you can't see god but his invisible attributes are seen in creation and he's saying it's not only clearly uh, seen but also it is something that has been understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power. So you can see his eternal power in creation and the Godhead. So you are without any excuse. So Gentiles, people who do not know Jesus, people who do not have the word of God, the Bible, you know, there's no excuse for them. Because why? Creation itself reveals the glory of God. Creation itself is very clearly you know, revealing to us the invisible attributes of God, revealing to us the eternal power of God is also revealing the Godhead. So none of us are without any excuse, okay? So even as we ponder on creation, you know, it helps us see his um, glory, okay? Creation reveals the glory of God. Look at what Psalms 19 verse 1 says. Psalms 19 verse 1. Can somebody read that, please? The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Okay. So the vastness of our universe you know, is basically, um, uh, firmament basically means the, the expanse, the sky, the space, everything shows his handy works. The vastness of our universe indicates the greatness of our creator, God. Like Psalm 147 verse 4 says, you know, count the number of stars and he calls them each by name. Mm -hmm. okay? he, God even calls each of the stars by name. Okay, and what happens, what does this lead to? Look at uh, the same chapter, verse 5. So can somebody read Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5, please? He determines and counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is inex inexhaustible and boundless. So the psalmist is saying, hey, you know, he counts the number of stars and he calls them each by name. And what is, when, what is the psalmist doing? He's actually pondering on God's creation. He's thinking, he's meditating. Can you imagine he's even thinking about, oh, hey, God is counting the stars. He's calling them by name. You know, so wonderful. And what is it leading the psalmist to do? It's leading the psalmist to exalt God. Okay, and in verse 5 saying, great is our God and mighty in power and his understanding is infinite. So what is it leading him to? It's leading him to glorify, exalt and worship God. Okay, and God is truly infinite. He is so great. He is so dominant over all creation. Look at what Isaiah mentions in Isaiah 40 verses 12 and 13. So great is our God. Look, look at Isaiah 40, 12 and 13. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, 
or as his counselor has taught him. Yeah, so here even Isaiah is caught up by the greatness of God and caught up with his dominance over all creation that is just leading him to just praise him and exalt and magnify his name. Okay, so we've learned about God as creator, Jesus as a creator. So what should it lead us to do? Firstly, what should it lead us to do? Consider, thank you, one person is awake. Consider, ponder, meditate. And what else should that lead to do? When the psalmist considered, pondered, meditate, what it lead him to do? Glorify him, worship him, exalt him, worship him for his majesty, for his greatness, for his glory as revealed in creation. Sanjay says, is in, inspires us to live a life that honors him and the opportunity to be here in this world at this point in time. Yes. Yes, basically just worship him and praise him and adore him for who he is, for his greatness. You know, a God of order, a God of beauty, a God of excellence, a God of perfection. So when you look at it, it basically talks to me in my own life that when God can just make creation so beautiful, so perfect, bring about order and perfection and everything good and make perfect. You know, when he created me in his image, how much more is he going to perfect things in me, do things that are good, do things that are orderly in my life and do things that are going to bring out his beauty. It just, it just leads us to worship and praise him. So I hope even as we're learning Christology, a lot of theology is going to basically lead you to know more of this God uh, whom we know to serve, to worship him and to worship him for who he is in all his greatness. Is, am I too loud? No? Okay. Okay, so all of this is going to lead out in song, in worship, in adoration and in glorifying him. Okay. So that was chapter three for us. Any questions anyone has? Any doubts? Anything you want to ask? Before we move on to chapter 4. No questions? Online students? Okay. If there are no questions, then we'll move on to chapter 4. So basically in chapters 1, 2, and 3, we studied about the deity of Jesus Christ. We established the fact that Jesus is God. by looking at various scripture passages that point to his pre-existence, his equality with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and his role in creation. Thus we established the fact that Jesus is deity, which means that he is God. Okay, now we'll move on in chapters four and the subsequent chapters, we will examine about Christ's humanity. So in Christology, <laughs> what are we studying in Christology? Sister, one question, sister. Yes, uh, yes, go ahead, Lucy. Sister, can you help us out in the third question? How will we apply 1 Corinthians 8, 6 in our daily life? Application. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 8 and 6. Verse 6. <clears throat> okay. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Yeah, says, yeah. One God, the Father of whom are all things, for we, for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we live. Mm -hmm. Okay. How can we apply this in our lives? Yes, Any answers? How can we apply this in our lives? In our daily life. Praise. Sorry, Lucy. We praise him, worship him, and recognize him. Okay. Then you know that he's, he's the source of our creation. He's the source, okay. Sorry. Source of all blessings. The source of all blessings, okay. Anything else? His, our life is in him. 
right? He knows everything about our present, our future, the next moment. So we should be totally and utterly dependent on him or abandoning ourselves to him in his total care and trusting him for everything. Or at every juncture, at every point, just going back and saying, God, what do I do? How do I answer this? How do I take care of this? You know, what should I do? Or, uh, you know, what is the choice I need to make? Or what should I say to this person? Or what should I do in this? Uh, I'm faced with this situation. So totally just connecting ourselves with him. Okay, whether it's challenges, whether it's difficulties, even in joy and happiness, thank him. Okay, and when you're looking for things in life, looking for answers, looking for blessings, looking uh, for things, you know where to go. It's just above. He's just there. He's there to help us. Because in him we live. In him we live and move and have our being. He knows everything about us. He's our strength. He's our help. He's our hope. Does that help, Lucy? Yes, sister. Thanks, sister. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Any more doubts? Yes, sister. Yet we're going to study about his humanity now in chapter four. Okay. So in chapter four, in the subsequent chapters, we will examine the humanity of Christ. So any questions so far about the deity of Jesus Christ? Before we move on to his humanity. Not that when we move on to his humanity, you can't ask any questions on the deity. You can still. Yeah. Okay. So if there's no questions, no doubts, we'll move on to chapter four. Okay. In chapter four, we will uh, look at some uh, important Old Testament prophecies that were foretold about Christ's coming, the incarnation of Christ. When we say incarnation, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say incarnation? God becoming man. Thank you, Kofi. God becoming man or God taking on the nature of the form of man. Okay. So there are various Old Testament prophecies that talk about the incarnation, that also talk about the various aspects of Christ's work, uh, the person and work of Jesus Christ, which we will be studying in the subsequent chapters. But before we look at the prophecies concerning the incarnation of Jesus Christ, there are some important facts that we need to consider, ponder, to take hold of. Okay. The first thing is that bef even before God became man or God took on the human form, okay, um, was incarnation something in the mind of God somewhere after Adam and Eve sinned? Or, you know, when the judges refused to, or the Israelites refused to, walk according to God's ways or the kings refuse to, you know, walk along God's ways and keep his ordinances, his commands, and people were going astray. Did God plan incarnation during the course of the events of history? What do you think? When was incarnation conceived in the mind and the heart of God? It was planned much earlier, sister. Okay, uh, how much earlier, Lucy? Uh, in God. Sorry? Sister, when uh, Lucifer uh, had a fall that time, fall of but, Lucifer. Okay, when so Lucifer was master fall away from heaven. Okay, sorry. It was his master plan before itself. Master plan before itself? Okay, what is the before you're saying? Before what? Before. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> good answer. But before what? Take the mic, please. Just behind you. If we check in Genesis 3, 14, 15, there it is mentioned that first time God is uh, promising, like uh, you will get a savior. Okay, Genesis 3, he is promising that he 15, 15. Ah, promises that you will get a savior. Yeah. Yes. So is you're saying that after Adam and Eve sinned, that was conceived in the heart and mind of God. Okay. Sanjay says, Revelation 13, 8, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. 
is a phrase that refers to the preordained sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the salvation of mankind. So what do you think about Revelation chapter 13, verse 8? Even before the foundation of the world, that means even before the creation of the world, in the heart and mind of God, the full sufficient perfect sacrifice of Jesus, the plan of salvation was already a completed done thing. Thousands of years even before Jesus came on the scene, even before the creation of the foundation of the world. So when do you think incarnation was conceived in the heart and mind of God? Before time began, right? Thank you, Sanjay, for that. Before even creation, even before the foundation of the world, even before time began, the plan of salvation was conceived in the mind of God and was already a com done, completed thing in the heart and the mind of God. It was already finished. So everything that we see in happening in history, the past and the present and the future is already conceived in the heart and mind of God. It's nothing new to him. He did not say when Adam and Eve sinned, he didn't say, oh, oh, you know, my plans have all gone haywire. What do I do now? You know, he didn't say that. He already knew. Did he know Adam and Eve are going to sin? Yes. But what you mentioned about Genesis chapter 3, which is very good, yes, is about what he is how he is going to unfold that plan, okay? Not that it was conceived then and there, but it is already a done completed thing, but was something that he was revealing at that point of time in history to us, okay? So yes, if you look at, um, so Christ's incarnation was an event plan in the mind of God even before time began, even before creation. How do we know this? Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Amen. Thank you. So here it says that to save, for Peter is saying we are, we are saved with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the lamb without blemish, without any spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, which means this was already pre-planned in the heart and mind of God, even before the foundation of the world but was manifested, means was revealed to us in this time, in this age, okay? So somebody asks you, hey, you know, did God know Adam and Eve are going to sin? Yes, did he know that he's going to send Jesus as a savior? Yes, it was not something that he thought of everything after everything happened, but you can point them to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, okay? We'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? No? Okay, no questions. Uh, this Friday is a holiday. We've uh, missed three Fridays in a row right now. Or this is the second, two Fridays. Two Fridays in a row. Okay, so this Friday we are having a holiday. It's our Republic Day in India. So we won't have classes. So I'll see you next Tuesday. Please read your notes. Please read these scripture passages. Very important. Ponder, think God's creation. Praise and worship him and exalt him. And let his glory be manifested in our lives. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed week ahead. God bless all of you. Thank you.